We got uh, Chris Caius, Doug Shufflo. I haven't identified yet. Two thirty. So I'll call the meeting of the Kane County CARES Act Allocation Committee to order. Ask our clerk to please call the roll. Hanson. Here. Kenyon. Here. Franz. Here. Sanchez. Here. Surges. Thomas. Here. O'Shea. Here. All right. We have a quorum. Uh, as far as the minutes are concerned, we'll defer those till our next meeting. Public comment, is there anyone in the audience that would like to address the committee this afternoon? Hearing none, um, we'll move on to our agenda then. Yes. All right, um, first item is status of funds. Mr. Rickard, any additional updates since we last met? <clears throat> I do. What I show is uh, we received the funds on 423, $92,900,217.90. To date, we have $89,625.86 in interest. We're currently earning 25 basis points on that money. Uh, our total available for distribution right now is 
989-843-76. Thank you, Mr. Rickard. Um, our treasurer does a great job investing our funds and uh, maximizing return. Any um, questions of the treasurer regarding the status of funds? Hearing none, uh, next item is staff requirements for administration. Uh, Mr. McMahon, do you wanna address the committee? I do, thank you uh, and good afternoon. So I can kind of give an update as to what we've done since uh, you met last. Uh, we've taken really two, uh, what I think are significant and important steps. Uh, first, we hired our, I hired a program manager, Ms. Faviola Guzman, she's with me here uh, this afternoon. I wanted to introduce you all to her. Uh, Faviola is, just to give you a little background on her, uh, her career and education. She's a graduate of DePaul University and the College of DuPage, uh, their paralegal program. She's got a mix of private sector and public sector experience. The last couple of years uh, working with, uh, in the insurance industry, uh, handling claims, processing claims, evaluating claims, and before that, she was the program manager for the 16th Judicial Circuit's foreclosure mediation uh, program as well that was started uh, with your assistance and, and really spearheaded by then Chief Judge uh, Judy Bracca. Uh, today's her first day, so her focus today has been uh, really kind of you know onboarding and getting up to speed with county systems and things like that, but she's already uh, really dug, in, dug into uh, the Treasury Department guidance, the FAQs that we have put together um, and, and made some introductions around uh, the county so she'll know, have faces and names of who she'll be working with and communicating with. Uh, in addition to uh, bringing on Ms. Uh, Guzman starting today, uh, we selected uh, the outside consultant. Um, uh, we really had, uh, we conducted a competitive uh, RFP process. Uh, I received two proposals from two firms who I, I would describe as highly qualified, really outstanding credentials. Uh, both have a lot of experience in this space of working with uh, government entities to administer and uh, maintain compliance and document uh, government programs. Uh, we selected Kerber, Eck, and Brakel. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I refer to them as KEB. Uh, they, have a, uh, uh, they have a prior relationship with the county. They've worked with the Workforce Investment Board uh, historically here in Kane County. Uh, we uh, did some background, um, kind of in, not investigation, but inquiry into their work with the county over the last couple of years and really received out rave reviews from both uh, Workforce Investment Board and then also the Finance Department uh, from Mr. Onzik's department about his experience and his team working with KEB staff on these other projects. Uh, we're kind of in the finalization of uh, the agreement between uh, with KEB and I'll have that done if not today, uh, early tomorrow. They already have uh, the documents that uh, I reported to you on last week. That's the intergovernmental agreement, the application and the FAQs that we put together uh, as well. So they're getting a, a jump start there. So that's my report since last week. I do have some uh, other things to talk to you. I think that might be later uh, in your agenda if you'd like. Just to follow up on the, um, the steps you've taken uh, since our meeting in terms of uh, budget. Uh, economic cost of the consultant on the uh, outside? Proposed so, uh, ballpark? I, 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 KEB's uh, estimate, it's a, it's a blended rate of about 100, I think it's $175 an hour, I have the exact figure. It was a little bit less uh, when I looked at their blended rate compared to the other uh, consultant. Uh, when they when I looked at the estimates of work involved between the two consultants, uh, the estimate uh, total cost uh, is about two hundred and ninety five thousand dollars. That's about one hundred thousand dollars less than the other consultant as well. So that was a factor. Uh, in my mind, cost wasn't the the main factor. It really was. Uh, and, and again, both two outstanding firms um, was the relationship, the prior work record that KEB has working with county level staff people. And again, my office had no relation, prior relationship with either one of these entities, the county did. Uh, and the, the staff here, the finance department from Mr. Onzik's office uh, and Scott Berger's office uh, uh, really spoke very highly of their prior experience. 
All right, and then the uh, staff uh, person, uh, Mr. McMahon, that's in your current budget? That's in my current budget, yes. Okay. And so uh, the initial portion of the consultant will be paid out of the state's attorney's budget as well. As I reported to you, uh, I think a couple weeks ago now, uh, just because of kind of how the workload has, has altered this year because of COVID, uh, there is always money within the state's attorney's budget for outside legal services and consulting services that, where we need to bring in outside uh, experts to work on a specific project. I haven't gone through those funds this year like I have in prior years. Uh, and so I'm able to apply those line items in the state's turn, my budget, uh, to the beginning portion of this project. It's not gonna cover everything, but it's gonna cover a significant portion of the administrative costs. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. McMahon regarding the staff requirements at this point? Mr. Hush. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I understand that uh, I'm assuming that all of the procurement laws uh, are being uh, followed, have been followed in this case? Yes. Okay. And uh, can you describe the process of, uh, I understand that uh, uh, the RFQ was sent out or RFP was sent out. Um, can you describe the dates and, and then uh, the, the time that applications came in, things like that? Uh, so I don't have an exact timeline. We, we issued a request for a proposal. I received written proposals from two different firms. Uh, they're both fairly detailed. They worked, they laid out a, uh, a proposed timeline uh, how they would assist the county. I would say one of the proposals really focused on uh, kind of working with uh, all of you as policymakers on uh, how to allocate money and what you should spend uh, money on. And the KEB uh, proposal really focused on uh, what I would describe as implementation and working with county staff to document um, the proposals and the request for reimbursement from the uh, from the various from the municipalities and the the entities that you might award uh, reimbursement uh, money to. Uh, so we reviewed both proposals, uh, written proposals. Uh, I then uh, did a a, uh, a video conference interview of both firms. Uh, we then met again internally. When I say we. Uh, individuals from uh, my office and then individuals from Mr. Berger's office. Um, uh, talked to some other folks in the county who had, uh, or I solicited input from other people in the county who, uh, as I indicated, have worked um, or had some familiarity with either one of the firms. Uh, I took that all into consideration um, and uh, made the selection last week. Okay. I Let's see, I understand that the RFP went out on uh, last Wednesday, on July 22nd, is that right? As I said, I don't have the dates in front of me, but that sounds, that's, okay. that's a problem. Right. After the meeting, if you could send out the criteria so everyone can That's good. That'd be good. Uh, the 22nd, and I think that there's a concern, I have a concern that the deadline was uh, noon on Friday the 24th. And uh, last week at this meeting, uh, Mr. McMahon, you uh, reported to us that, quote, every Collar County has retained an outside consultant. I've received two proposals over the weekend uh, that would have been uh, last weekend's. Uh, and then the second was one, let's see, one over the weekend and one was this morning that Mr. Berger and I will review and have a recommendation, really, I hope by a week from today. Okay, so that was the previous week and so did you have both of those, uh, did you have both of the proposals uh, from both consultants by the due date? Uh, is this, I don't know the exact time that I got both proposals in. They were both submitted to me by uh, email. So uh, I can send that out after the meeting as okay. well. Right. And if we can have a package of the information of, uh, I had the uh, privilege of working with um, uh, being co-chairman of the Legislative Audit Commission, uh, both the House and the Senate in Illinois, uh, co-chairman for 10 years with Frank Martino, who's now the Auditor General, uh, have extensive background uh, with uh, reviewing KEB's work. And um, 
uh, they're, they're a standard accounting firm uh, in Springfield. Um, I'll, I'll wait to see the packages, both packages of uh, both different consultants uh, before I make a concluding remark on it. Is a consensus of the committee to move forward is with Mr. McMahon's uh, background as it relates to this issue? Any objections? All right, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. John, yeah, Doug Shefflow here. Um, so is this is a recommendation of a selection from the state's attorney to the CAC committee who will in turn will make a recommendation to the county board? No, this was a, uh, Doug, we empowered the state's attorney's office as the individual because our rest of our staff was overworked and unavailable to help um, uh, to oversee the program. And we empowered the state's attorney, uh, directed him to move forward uh, to engage the party. This, you know, the deliberateness of this process, you know, most other counties had their consultant on 60 days ago plus. We got started late. Um, there were two legitimate candidates. Uh, the, through the vetting process at the state's attorney's office, they selected one of the two entities. And uh, so the plan is to move forward on that basis. Without the county board approval? So let me ask one other question. So it didn't go through the regular purchasing for the county? Uh, no, it did not go through the purchasing department. They, the RFPs were sent to me uh, based on the direction from this committee. Um, right, I, I retained, uh, I'm in the process of retaining KEB. But, uh, but out of your budget or out of the CAC funds? So the initial uh, portion will come out of the state's attorney's budget. Uh, that's where the funding for the program manager, so Ms. Guzman, is coming out of the state's attorney's budget. Uh, the initial uh, outlay of expenses for the consultant will come out of the state's attorney's budget. Uh, but we, uh, I anticipate, uh, I'll ask you to pass a budget uh, for kind of the administration of this program uh, at some point and additional expenses, I believe, will have to come out of that administrative budget uh, of the CRF funds. We had okay. discussed last a week a budget for approximately six hundred thousand dollars for the administrative cost of the program. Uh, the Good. committee uh, mm -hmm. uh, anticipated that that would be an approximate cost that we would allocate to the process. Obviously, subject to verifying with an appropriate um, uh, invoices for work performed or staff time allocated. Uh, so, it was through that process that uh, we set aside. Uh, logistically, and in this meeting, our, the plan is to make a recommendation which the board can either support um, and the chairman can either support or they can object to, uh, but it will be the will of the board to make a decision going forward as to how we're going to do the allocations. And I okay. expect that there'll be significant input and debate on that issue. Thank you. All right. Just, I want to move on from this issue. John, one, just one thought. Um, I understand what you said about uh, other counties had their 60 days ago. If I'm not mistaken, Will uh, County, DuPage County and Lake County selected the other consultant that was under consideration for Kane. We don't have to follow anybody else's lead, but that is, uh, you know, as long as that was mentioned that they- How is that inconsistent with my comment about when the date- Not was inconsistent. That they were it's, it's not inconsistent at all. All right. It's that- the uh, fact is they went through this process in a more deliberate fashion, and we're here <clears throat> scrambling to get uh, our act together so that we can move forward and I, I, get uh, the money out. So, Mr. Hoshite, I object to the, we're not scrambling. This They're isn't, negotiating. Mr. Chairman, this isn't a court of law that you don't have to object. Um, well, no. I, I want to move on to the next issue. So the next item. Well, can I is, not speak no, to these? Mr. You can, you've had your can comments. I, you've. You're asking questions that you apparently know the answers to already. This is more of a, it's not an informational or an inquisition. It's a, it's a meeting where the consensus of the committee is to go forward. Uh, we've got a long agenda today. I wanna get through it. And I think we've covered this issue. If there's more uh, discussion, we can discuss it as executive or at the full board as we move forward. 
All right, uh, next item is intergovernmental agreements and uh, the indemnity agreements, Mr. McMahon. Well, they're both out with the consultant. I believe they're essentially done. They may have some final uh, revisions based on input from the consultants. I have not sent them out to the, the various municipalities. I just, I want the consultant to have an opportunity to weigh in on those before I distribute those. All right, now we approved conceptually that agreement subject to the consultant's review yes, at our did. prior meetings. Then uh, when is the, uh, as you move forward, when would we have uh, the final uh, format? Uh, I, I, I hope within the next uh, one to two weeks at the most. Uh, I know that's, a, that's an early kind of target for us to hit. Um, so that's priority for us to get that finalized and then out the door to uh, municipalities. I think it was the hope of the committee to have this wrapped up within you know this week or so. So yes. any effort you can to get that completed would be uh, welcome. And Mr. Shefflow, that goes to the issue of the selection of the uh, consultant and the timing. Um, having a, a final application in a format that is approved is important before it goes out. And the goal was to get the applications out right away. All right, any questions about the indemnity agreements? Mr. Chairman, this is Ms. Thomas. I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I, this is for the state's attorney. I, I would like to know what would um, prevent a, um, finalization of the, the documents within a week? I mean, I think two weeks is just unacceptable. But if there's some other onboarding activities, some other some other things that take precedence, um, I, I would just like more information about that because I I just really think this has to be done within a week. I agree with you. It has to be done this week, and I think it will be done this week. I just, as I sit here today, uh, I haven't asked for a, a you know a hard deadline back from the consultant. Um, so I believe it'll be done this week. And I okay. understand your and the rest of the committee and the rest of the board members' uh, preference for this to be done uh, quickly. Thank you. All right, item D is just a follow up from last week. We, we set the application once it's out, we provided for a 14 day time frame for a response. Uh, so I don't think that has changed. Um, the significant, one of the significant issues we need to address today and, and with the hopes that we would make a recommendation to executive committee in the full board is the allocation of the funds. Now we talked about conceptually 5545 where 55 was to the county and 45 was uh, to the local governmental entities. Uh, but last week uh, we introduced concepts of allocation of some funds uh, to business grants, some to not-for-profit organizations, some to other governmental bodies such as park districts and for, primarily park districts and forest preserves districts, um, and some uh, funds for the administration of the process, and also finally a contingency amount. So what I'd like to do is go through today and come up with this committee with a proposal for a recommendation that we can move forward because the allocation of the funds is ultimately going to be, have to be decided. Um, and once applications come in, we need to know how much our funds are being allocated to each different segment. And to the extent that we're going to do business grants, we have to get a business grant program in place um, and get those applications out as soon as possible if we're going to do that. So I guess I'll start out with uh, one of the um, what I'll consider one of the easier ones. The original recommendation for the administrative costs was in the uh, $600,000. That was a ballpark estimate that was developed after consulting with uh, Scott Berger and staff regarding potential costs. Recognize that some of those funds would go uh, for reimbursement for outside parties, but also uh, some of the funds would be reimbursement for staff time that's uh, allocated just as we do with um, other uh, grant programs. The Riverboat Grant pays for our staff time and, and CDBG pays for our, our staff time. So does anyone on the committee have uh, any objection to moving forward with a recommendation of $600,000 for administrative costs? All right, anyone on the uh, phone? 
or, or, or on the um, conference call, 600 is okay. All right, um, next item, uh, let's talk about, um, we talked about fire protection districts. Is there a uh, recommendation regarding the amount that would go to fire protection districts, Mr. Fraz? Um, somewhat unscientific, but I understand South Elgin was gonna submit a, uh, a proposal for a request for $80,000. So using them kind of as a basis uh, point, I think there's 22 districts um, I, I left my, my math at home, but uh, the, we had allotted 1 million set aside in our, in our rough budget. Right. And um, doing the math, I, I think we'd be well, uh, well off by maybe upping that slightly to, I would recommend 1.35 million. And that would allow a, uh, a reasonable ask based on the average of the districts. Some of them may have very little, but some of them may have more than that. All right, any other feedback from the committee, Mr. Sanchez? Have we not been given any rough numbers from all the fire districts yet? I know Ken Shepard was trying to collect at least just a general estimate that the fire districts would need. We don't have a cumulative total. Some of them were included. Originally, we started this process uh, suggesting that they may be included in some of the municipal requests, but um, for a number of reasons, including the desire to have direct recipients and that liability issue, uh, an audit issue, we decided that uh, it would be in best interest to have the fire districts or the cities who have fire departments to include those direct uh, funds in their applications. So I don't have a total number. Uh, I did, Mr. Shepro did do math that was similar to what Mr. Fraz had indicated, trying to estimate what the cost would be. But um, until we get all the applications in, um, we, we won't know that now. Mm -hmm. Jumping ahead, one of the reasons they have a contingency fund is if for some reason the amount came in at $2 million and we felt that all the applications were worthy, then we may want to allocate some funds to make up the difference. But we need a starting point for the discussion at this point, okay. so. Uh, well, I'm willing to go with at least the rough tentative math right, right now, 1.35. All right, anyone else on the committee have a concern about that or comment yeah. or objection? Mr. Hansen? I value whatever work and homework that Drew's done. And I don't have an objection to raising it from one to 1.35. I will combine my comment on this with a, with my suggestion for the park district and that whatever we do allocate for the fire protection districts and for park districts and forest reserve should come out of the 45% piece of the municipalities. And the goal of uh, it's kind of doing some of the municipalities a favor in by keeping it a direct recipient. But, all right, so team. we can, we'll talk about that as we go through the okay. process. That'll be kind of step two, if that's all okay. right. Sure. Any other one, any other comments of anyone on the board? All right, so the consensus is 1.35 million for fire protection districts. Uh, the next would be what we'll call other governmental entities, which would be parks and forest preserve districts. Um, is there a recommendation on this? I know DuPage County set aside a million dollars. We're not just as a ballpark, not because we have to be like DuPage County, but as an example. I think that will end up being adequate. You know, they're not like the fire departments where they're running medical units 24 um, seven. Right. And uh, based on what our own district uh, has mentioned to us, I think that would be adequate. So you're recommending a million dollars? Recommending leaving it at the one million uh, placeholder. Right. And Mr. Sanchez? I would recommend that as well, and also including the idea that townships are included then in the other local units of government right. as well. So just to clarify, we're talking about townships, park districts, and forest preserve districts. Can I ask a question? Yes. So. Wait, Mr. Kenyon has the floor first. Mr. Kenyon. His mic's not on. Um, like, turn on your mic, Mr. McMahon. So when we when, when we kind of came up with those placeholders, we did include uh, townships in that category of other units of local government. So park districts, forest preserve districts, and then townships would be included in that. Yes. Right. 
So does that uh, impact the amount of allocation or do we feel that the million dollars would be sufficient? I, I just don't know. I, it's going, all going to the people, we'll do the best good we can. I just don't know how much, how many expenses the, the townships, I'm thinking of my own township, but how many expenses these townships have incurred. Uh, depends on what programs. Some have no programs going on and others may have some fairly extensive ones. So I, I really can't speak to that. I've only talked to Elgin and to uh, Hampshire. Mr. Not huge. Mr. Sheflo, you had a question? Yeah, mine was really, uh, is there an exhibit that you're working through? Uh, I'm sorry to drag it out like this, but where would I find that exhibit or can it be put on the screen? Would there, there was an example that was uh, provided at last week's meeting that just had the, the breakdowns of potential, but I'm working off of um, really uh, recollection and, and the discussion we had last week, Doug. So at the last meeting, it was it a, there was no information attached to the agenda. So was it, anybody know where I would find it or quickly so I if not? It, I distributed it by email uh, to you and all the board members last after, week. So okay. yes, sir. After the meeting, right? Yes, sir. All right, thanks. All right, so uh, the recommendation is a million dollars for local governmental units that we've described here. Any other questions or comments on that, Barb? It, is that the uh, the entities that will go through the development department for approval? Are the no, we're talking, three? this is, well, one option would be that they could go through the, but these are entities that are gonna come direct to us. Right, okay. Right. okay. All right, so if the consensus is a million dollars there, we'll move forward with that. All right. Um, Next, let's talk about business grants. <clears throat> uh, the original discussion considered having business grants grow through the cities themselves, but because of the um, audit concern and the desire to have business grant recipients uh, have a direct relationship with the county as the county is the responsible party, the committee indicated that if we we're gonna do a program, we would do it as a direct grant program. Um, so the question is, if we're gonna do that program, what uh, is the appropriate dollar amount to allocate to that program? Mr. Sanchez. Um, I think this is an important part of this, part of the conversation. I think it might be easier if, at least in my, my mind, I think of what is the per capita we're going to be giving the municipalities? That's the most, to me, the most important piece of the external um, requests. And then we'll kind of see how much room we have to play with for small business and nonprofit. Because I know at least on the sheet that we had last week, there is two different per capita numbers. $55 per person seems to be a good average that, that has been going around. And I would like to see something at least very close to that. Uh, so I don't know if that would be more important to determine first and then come back to small business and nonprofit. Well, I think the um, there's two ways to do it. I think the in order to get to those numbers that you're suggesting, we would be able to calculate the per capita um, available funds. The I guess the, here's here's the I, there's again different ways to look at it. My suggestion is. Um, and this is based on, it's not my personal opinion, but this is the input I've received from members of this committee and all the other board members who contacted me to discuss this. There was a significant um, uh, support among the board to have a business grant program. And the, the question is, uh, you know, how much would we allocate for that? What would it look like? Uh, if we're going to have a program, we have to develop program parameters for the program. Uh, but there was a commitment to set aside at least a sum of money to do that. Uh, and it, one of the options was to wait till we got all the municipal applications in. And, and I can tell you, at least based on the numbers, at least you've seen from the county, that if we did that and granted all the requests, there wouldn't be any money left over for business grants. Okay because the applications for expense reimbursement would exceed that. So the thought process was to 
carve out a sum of money that we feel comfortable with now, knowing that there'll be sufficient funds left over for the other parties. And one of the debates or uh, issues we're gonna have to deal with is not just how much we're gonna set aside, but from what pool does that come? Mr. Hansen alluded to that earlier. Does it come from the municipal side? Does it come from the uh, county side or does it, is it shared between the two? And that'll have an impact on the per capita number um, that is left over. Both will have an impact. So I, I think the reason that we have approached it the way we have is because of the board saying they wanted to have a program in place and they wanted to earmark funds for that. And I think that's, again, uh, just as an example, the other counties have done it that way too, because, it, and then uh, the, the theory being, if we waited till after the fact, then the grants may go out later and then that creates a problem for the businesses that could benefit from them. I would be more comfortable knowing we have at least $55 per person for the municipalities, but um, I, I hear what you're saying and I would recommend 5 million for small business. DuPage has done 7 million. They're a little bit larger than us and they seem to think that's that's a pretty reasonable number for their needs and I think $5 million would be a pretty good number for Kane County. All right, Mr. Sanchez is recommending 5 million. Any other input, Mr. Hansen? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll remain on record that I believe that that the amount we set that we do set aside an earmark for business aid should come from the the county piece, if you will, the county bucket. And I'm happy to be on record for recommending eight million dollars for the small business program. Um, there's lots of different programs to look at as we've gotten further and further away from when funds were allocated from the government. Um, I think a, a one a one tiered uh, system, if you will, for these grants. And again, establishing a portal and establishing a process quickly to, to get aid out as, as equitably and as quickly as possible is a way to go. But I recommend $8 million from the county piece to go out to, to business grants and not loans. All right, we have two different recommendations, Mr. Frost. Make it a third. Um, I'm really happy with the 10 million. I, you know, the hard thing is finding a population of small businesses and then knowing how many of them will actually apply uh, I really have been pushing for uh, going after true small businesses, which a lot of counties have defined as 2.5 million in gross sales or less. Um, if we if we had 2,000 small businesses apply for loans of $5,000, that makes $10 million. I, I really like the $10 million placeholder. Um, maybe I'll recommend 12 so we can negotiate to 10. All right. <laughs> So your recommended recommendation is $10 million. Just to, and again, when we get into the actual program discussions, if this is established, we'll have to talk about what the grant levels will be. And that of course has an impact on how many businesses we can benefit. Mr. Kenyon, do you have- I like input? 10 million best. Mr. Sergis? I did not hear the other. I did not hear the other proposals. Okay, Mr. Sorry. Sanchez felt 5 million was sufficient and um, Mr. Hansen is supported eight million. I, I would support eight. Ms. Thomas. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, you know, the other piece of the puzzle here is um, nonprofits. And so if we're looking to um, make a decision with respect to funding for nonprofits, 10, 10 million is a, a good round number for both businesses and nonprofits. So I, I would say split split the difference um, and go with eight for the businesses. And while we're not on the on the subject of nonprofits yet, two million for the nonprofits. All right. So using the calculator in my head, the consensus is around $8 million. Is that acceptable at this point? All right, any other input from uh, any other board members or Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, the reason why we've been deliberate in this process is that the rules are changing even as we speak right now. In Washington, D.C., they're uh, talking about new plans. As we're setting aside these uh, dollar amounts, have we taken into consideration the uh, flexibility that most of the proposals have for lost revenue? So I, I wouldn't want... Um, us to experience what other counties have experienced uh, that NACO sent out a note the other uh, day saying uh, that 
the negotiate or the negotiations on legislation of what they anticipate says that the allowable uses of relief payments to include lost revenue. One of the notes that it said, uh, they said, this is where it's getting confusing. What if states have already obligated the CRF money and no longer have 25% to share on lost revenue? So just uh, it, these rules are changing as we speak. And so I think that we need to be uh, careful that as we set up for small business, nonprofit, uh, even the allocation with municipalities that we take into effect that uh, some of the partners in this process will want maximum flexibility, which is on the lost revenue. All right, and I, you know, I, if we did make a commitment to a program here that, that I think we do that with our eyes open that as the other counties have with their programs that to the extent the rules changed and they could have otherwise increased the allocation to the county or to the municipalities, the board consciously decided that the allocations that they did, they're willing to live with, uh, and, and that because it was a priority. And so if the uh, consensus is for businesses, at least at this point for 8 million, um, then let's talk about not-for-profits uh, uh, yet left. Uh, Ms. Thomas is suggesting that we set aside 2 million for not-for-profit organizations. Mr. Sergis. I would support Ms. Thomas in that. Um, you know, one, one question is, and this is a challenge as we deal with this uh, sector. Uh, we've had this challenge every year as we've done our riverboat grants. There's not one not-for-profit that's better than another, at least in my experience in the county. We've got a seasoned group of not-for-profit organizations that provide different types of benefits and service to the community. And the question is, uh, are we going to, uh, identify a specific sector of the not-for-profit group organizations that would qualify for, or are we gonna open up completely? Uh, we've had presentations from uh, Hesed House who demonstrated a need. We had uh, presentations from Aurora University uh, that had a need. Um, I know that at least input I've received from some of the board members was uh, although they acknowledged the need of all of the organizations that there would be a bias toward um, entities uh, that provide shelter for the homeless and also uh, food banks um, as, as being the, pri the primary source of funding. So uh, that's just a discussion um, in terms of administration and, and grant acceptance. I think as we develop that program, that's something we have to talk about. But um, we've got a $2 million number. I didn't want to cut off the discussion on that, but if we're gonna put that into this uh, program, it's probably appropriate to understand that. Um, how about the rest of the committee? What are the thoughts in terms of the numbers? I think that's a fair number. Mr. Hansen? I think it's a fair number too, and it, it does depend on what the universe is gonna be for possible applicants, and I think if it's limited to those that are challenged with housing and 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 food insecurities and possibly social services that that have aided those that are most impacted by the coronavirus. It's a small universe, two million is fair. All right. Mr. Sanchez, you concur? I'm comfortable with that. Kenyon? It's a start, but it will be barely enough. There are so many needs, so where do we start and stop? All right, any other input on that allocation? I'm Mr. Thinking. Chairman? Yes. Chef Blow. Um, this kind of relates to nonprofits and to the businesses. I, you know, businesses, I would be more in the 5 million number than the 10, but. Um, the recommendation now is eight, Doug. Yeah, I understand. Uh, okay. What I would su suggest, or I guess what I'm thinking is that we make these allocations um, contingencies because it's, you know, it's very difficult to say how much should you spend on something if you don't know what you're buying. Say, same is true with the nonprofits. Um, you know, if, if it, it's all going to go to social services, you know, I'd be in favor of more spending than if it's going to go to the arts or, you know, the Elgin Symphony or something like that, which has been hit as well. But um, so I'm about to spit it out here that um, 
maybe rather than allocating these specifically, calling them, uh, you know, putting them into contingencies so that w if we go from 2 million to 1 million in the future, you know, the, the nonprofits don't feel like they've been cut 50%. Uh, business doesn't feel like it's been cut, you know, that it's really just in contingencies until we develop a framework and a goal. And, you know, there's a lot of work to how do you apply? What's your max? Uh, so, Doug, here's what I recommend. Here's what I would think we would do, and it just depends on the length of this meeting. But the expectation is, once we make these allocations, then we would um, either today or at our next meeting develop the programs for them, uh, set up the criteria for the permissible recipients, uh, so that we would be able to go out right away and do that. The uh, contingency fund is a separate issue. Um, certainly, it, if we if we limit the applicants under the not for profits to certain entities, we may not have two million in requests to deal with. But and those funds could flow back for reallocation. But um, if we're going to go through the work of establishing an application process, if we're going to do these, we've got to get out in front and get them done. So to, yeah. to I agree. I, I just saying if it's, you know, that it's a maybe identify it as a contingency for nonprofits, a contingency for business grants, and then okay, you know, that that's kind of a philosophy, I guess. In the preliminary allocation, we can vet this as we go through it. I think that right. concept is understood. Yep. Okay. All right, good point. All right. Any other comments on the not for profit sector, Mr. Fraz? Yeah, and we gotta keep in mind too that some entities aren't going to spend all the money allotted to them and we could, we'll have provisions for that money to come back to us in October and then we can kind of throw that back out where we've seen that we've been deficient in our estimates. So right. we'll have some flexibility there. All right. Um, the only other placeholder um, for uh, funding or allocations was a contingency fund, uh, which was discussed. The example we saw was a $5 million number. That was simply a number that was created. It's appropriate that we consider that uh, to have some extra funds available, uh, depending on what we get in, in applications. We had an example of the fire districts, if they came in higher, to have some additional funds for that. I think everyone supports reimbursement for fire related expenses to the extent they exist. So um, the question is, what's a reasonable number for that? and take suggestions. I, I had discussed 5 million last week, but that was just a number for purposes of discussion. Mr. Sergis. Mr. Chairman, I've been very comfortable with 10% since the original onset of this months ago. Um, where we're at today, I, I, 5 million seems reasonable um, to move forward with. And that, that's not quite 10% at all, but happy to live with that. It, that by having money in contingency too, it also gives us the ability, at least with respect to a portion of the funds, to deal with changes in regulations or pronouncements that come down from the federal government. So if they talk about, you know, at least we've reserved some funds for that purpose. Mr. Sanchez. To Mr. Uh, Chairman Lawson's point, this is something I've been thinking of the, the whole time when it comes to contingency is this possibility that we may be able to recoup lost revenue. And I don't remember the exact figure, but uh, I think we're looking at estimated six point something million dollars in lost revenue for this year. Do you know the number, Chris? Uh, not for King County, across all of our governments, I'm sure it's gonna be a huge number, but it, in our case, it'd be somewhere uh, for King County governments, maximum uh, that Current negotiation, from what I understand, is just talk at this point, but between 20 and 25 million. In lost revenue for Kane County? Uh, that it would be, uh, according to the rules they're talking about now, if you were to calculate a rough range of the flexibility that would be given to Kane County and also to local governments mm -hmm. uh, across our 92.9 .9 million would be 25%, so 20 to 25 yeah. million. So I'm just thinking just at least enough for Kane County government to cover lost revenue um, going into next year. At, you know, if, even if it's 6 million, if we have 5 million and some of it we have to take for other things, I'm comfortable with that as long as we have something. So 5 million is the lowest I would go. Ms. Thomas, do you have a feedback? Uh, 
I'm comfortable with the five million for contingency, um, but I, I do want to just uh, clarify. Um, I'm looking at the proposal that you um, presented and that we discussed at the last meeting, which presents the two scenarios. Um, just for my own clarification, um, the eight million for businesses and the two million for nonprofits, that's from the 55%, correct? We haven't decided that. That's the next discussion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, All right. So, All right. But the um, contingency is off the top, off of the 92 million, correct? That's what I would propose we do, but that's the game, yes. Okay. All right, so is uh, the consensus that 5 million is okay? Yes. All right. All right, so now to move to the next step here, uh, the issue Ms. Thomas raised, Mr. Hansen raised, and I know it's hard to do one without the other, but I think approaching it this way would be uh, appropriate so that we can craft a resolution to move forward. So does anyone object to the contingency uh, being allocated from the gross dollar amount that was available? Likewise, the cost of administration seems to me to be appropriate to share across the board. Mr. Hansen? Yes, it is. Just <clears throat> within that special line item for administration, should that cost increase, I think that should come out of our contingency fund. I also yes. believe that um, any interest we're, we're accruing for our overall ownership of this money should be built into right. the contingency fund. Yeah, our discussions, at least on the numbers that were used in the example that Mr. McMahon circulated did not take into account the interest. So that's additional resources that would be available. All right, so that's uh, the two components would come off the, uh, the, what we'll call the top, the gross amount available. Then we have uh, with respect to the, the other items are what we'll call other governmental entities. That's 1.35 million. Then we had, um, I just want to summarize these. Uh, business grants was 8 million. Not-for-profits was 2 million. And then, uh, oh, the fire, I'm sorry, 1.35 million was fire protection. And then the other was 1 million for park districts, forest preserves, and township governments. So that's other local governmental entities. Uh, I'll just go through each one and we can decide how we want to allocate them. Again, the real realistic options are to share it pro rata among the two, the 55-45, or to allocate it all to one or the other or do some proportional mix of those. So um, I'll first with respect to the uh, business grant money, let's talk about that because that's the largest sum. Um, what is the thought on that, Mr. Sanchez? Here's my thinking on this. All of these external uh, requests, I still think of in the 45% because when we passed that resolution a few weeks ago, we weren't thinking that we were going to be getting into doing the grants ourselves. We were thinking they, the municipalities were going to take care of it. The same for the fire districts and all other local uni units of government, nonprofits. So when we said we're going to give them 45%, it was including all of these requests in them, all these external requests. So I still think we should keep it in the, from that 45%. Right, we're so going to have a big battle to fight on how to spend our 55%. We have way more requests than we have money. So I think it, it, the original intention of our 55-45 was to keep these all external. All right, so let's focus on the $8 million first. Your recommendation is that come from the 45%? Yeah, all of these would... All, my recommendation would be all would come from right. All right. Does anyone have any input otherwise? Mr. Hansen? I've already been on record with the eight million or again, the amount that we decide on for business grants that should come from the from the county piece. Um, again, any any business that's alive and well, either as an employer or a place to generate tax revenue benefits the entire county. And by taking it out of the municipality's share, we're telling them how to spend their money. Um, once it's once we're identified and they've signed off on it, if they have more expenses than, than another municipality, they may need their entire per capita allocation. I think kind of a hybrid idea that I've heard along the way is that should a municipality not be able to use all their allocation, they could 
straight pipe that into our business grant program and make sure that some of that money is earmarked for their respective zip codes or businesses within their municipality. But um, I wholeheartedly believe that the, the business grant program should be administered by the county, should come from the county's piece. Mr. Frost. So they total, if my math's right, about $18 million if we put all those uh, earmarks in one pot. No, that we've already talked, to, it would be less than that because yeah. you, the 5.6 million was taken out, that comes off the top. Okay, but um, I guess a third way to do it would be to take all the asks that we've just negotiated and talked about, take them off the 92 and then divide the balance by the 45.55. That would be sharing them equally or not, or proportionately 45.55. Yeah. Mr. Martin? I just have a question. We've um, we've talked in the past about the the percentage of the pot John. We've talked in the past about the percentage of the population that lives in the unincorporated area. And when we dealt with the ninety-three million in gross, we said seven million to the to the unincorporated area. How does that that's going to be proportional. Thought process fit into bite. this conversation, I guess, is my question. So, depending if if the money uh, for allocation of the, um, Mr. Sanchez suggested it would reduce the unincorporated share um, by a certain percentage. I, you know, the if the the fire protection districts, um, I'm going to suggest we approach this a little differently. The fire protection districts, we had always thought in the beginning were going to be part of the municipal fund and or the unincorporated areas, those dollars. So to allocate the fire protection district to the municipal pool would be consistent with our discussions from day one. So does anyone have any objection to doing that? I think if we go through the components, it may be a little easier to at least follow the logic as to what we're doing. That would answer Mr. Martin's question because the original $7 million anticipated you would be allocating a portion of that to the fire protection districts for the unincorporated areas. Correct. And if we're gonna do that directly, then that would be appropriate to reduce that from your fund. Okay. Does anyone have a problem with that issue? Oh. I just wanna make sure we don't spend it twice yeah, here. Right. Tell me what you, So we're saying- we've So got, in my T chart, Fire protection goes where? County or muni? It goes to municipal. Okay, which includes unincorporated. The municipal, well, for the purpose of this discussion, the unincorporated areas is a separate municipality. That's how we're treating them under this program. All right, uh, then the other local, okay, th then we have the other local governmental entities. That's park districts, forest preserves, and townships. Um, I don't know if we really talked about that. Is it appropriate to take that from one or the other or share it? So it's, it's the smallest out of the amount, but it's still a significant dollar amount. I, f I found it interesting. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes. Um, so looking at, again, this um, handout from last week with the two scenarios, right. there's approximately 4.5 million for, um, that's part of the 45% for unincorporated areas. So wouldn't the 1 million, I'm sorry, yeah, the 1 million for park districts come from that? Well, park districts are both incorporated and unincorporated. If you wanted to you reduce the, um, I mean, that that's another option you could deal with. You could say townships would be funded through the unincorporated fund. That may make some logical sense. I, it's really up to the committee to decide. I just want to, you know, as we go through this, we, we should do it deliberately and, and come up with a, a thought that works. So I have no objection to doing, taking that approach. Mr. Sergis, you were cut off there, so sorry. I, I found it interesting this weekend and I just, I don't know why I didn't think of it sooner, but one of the park district um, representatives had made comment to me that they're not out an enormous amount of money because they laid off a huge amount. And I said, explain that to me. As I was thinking more of a forest preserve district mentality. They said, if nobody's golfing, we don't have staff and the golf courses were closed. So we literally laid off 70% of our entire team 
right. that we're just now layering back in little by little. So, and, and I said, I didn't even think of it that way. I mean, I just- So you're, it, there is a distinction between the entities that we're talking about in this that, category that'll become apparent when the applications come in. Park tax districts tend to be uh, program rich. Correct. So if there's COVID that canceled all the programs, the staff associated with those may have been laid off. They still have to maintain their facilities that they have available. And so their expenses would tend to be less than let's say a, a forest preserve, which tends to be more environment rich with less programs. So it's maintaining trails and dealing with the public coming to picnic areas and things of that nature. The just, just one of those conscious right. things that- That's why those numbers, when we look at the numbers here, that even though we have a number of entities there in that group, the million dollar number theoretically should be sufficient to cover that entire group because we've got a number of, we've got one forest preserve district and a number of park districts and then some townships that uh, will have uh, requests as well. So we can evaluate them when they come in. But for those who laid off people, then their, uh, their losses would be less than, right? Or their additional expenses would be less. All right, so in terms of the other local governmental entities, we need to come to a consensus as to which portion is appropriate to allocate those from, you know, I, I, we, were, we could do it from county, from municipal, we could share them, or as Ms. Um, Thomas suggested, we could take it from the unincorporated uh, allocation. I'd suggest splitting it. 55-45? Well, if we took, um, yeah, yeah. All right. Does anyone have an objection to splitting that? John? This is Ms. Thomas. I don't have an, an objection to splitting the 8 million for business and 2 million for nonprofits, but the 1.35 and the 1 million, I think if, I think that should come from the, the unincorporated pot. I mean, we already kind of have the money's earmarked. And if long, as long as the fire protect, protection district or the park district, it covers some portion of unincorporated area, why not take it from that pot of money that we've already kind of set aside? Well, I think there's a distinction between the two, Ms. Thomas. I think we, we agreed the consensus was the fire protection district would come from the municipal section, which also includes an unincorporated allocation. Um, Mr. Chairman had a comment. I think, I, I wonder, just clarification for Ms. Thomas's point. Uh, Ms. Thomas, do you mean unincorporated only or unincorporated and incorporated? Do you actually mean local government or am I misinterpreting your, the, 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 the thrust of your point? So if, you know, again, I'm, I'm looking at this document with the two scenarios. That is which... very helpful, by the way. And, and I, I would suggest I'm working off of that here rather than memory or math at home. Uh, so I think that that'd be a good thing to put up on the screen because it does help keep uh, some of these numbers straight. That's a very useful thing that, that uh, you're working off of. Right. And so I'm just wondering about this roughly 4.5 million for unincorporated within the 45%, I'm saying, why not take the, you know, 1 million for, for park districts, townships, other local governments, and the 1.35 from the fire districts. I mean, since we, you know, it, as long as you have some portion that's in unincorporated area, could that 2.35 be taken from the Amount we've already I think the, the consensus of the committee was that the fire districts would come from the municipality. So you can dissent on that. I think we've already decided that. But the, oh, okay. the million dollars coming from unincorporated, I think there's logic to that in the sense, at least, that most of the township requests will likely come from townships that provide significantly more services in the rural areas of the county than they would necessarily in the incorporated areas where there's obviously road districts uh, tend, you know, the, in St. Charles Township, there's a lot less roads to take care of 
uh, because most of, many of them are municipal roads, whereas in Campton Township, it may be a different situation. Okay. Ms. Nikki. Uh, just briefly, uh, just don't forget Dundee Township and Campton Township have open space programs and uh, right. Campton alone has like 1500 acres that they take care of. So that may fall in the same category as Forest Preserve. That's yeah, that mm -hmm. Campton doesn't have a park district, so they have an open space district. Exactly. Dundee actually has both. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I got distracted on uh, the clarification of uh, Ms. Thomas's point, uh, but to quantify what uh, Mr. Sanchez was saying, uh, following and, and if with the chairman's permission, uh, if we were to put up the scenario two of the document that was handed out last week, uh, and I believe that that's in the system, uh, to keep track of what we're doing, the County's portion was 55%, local government 45%, uh, you know, generally speaking. If you take the net amount of the, okay, so it's gross of the 92.9 minus the 5 million and this uh, for contingency and 600,000 for administration expense, and you use 87.3 million for the uh, denominator. So that's the bottom number of the fraction. Right, we've gotten to that point so far. Yes, exactly. And, and, and I see, you know, we're trying to work down so that we get it to a conclusion. Uh, in both cases of the 4.5 million for unincorporated and 34.779, so 34.8 million, uh, that's true for both scenario uh, one and scenario two. If you divide that total, which is 39.3 million by the 87.3 million, the local government stays at 45%. And what's happening as we go through the process, and I'm just suggesting that we have to be careful as Mr. Sanchez has cautioned us. Uh, and I, I know that some of the conclusions are coming out that, well, it goes to local government, but uh, the county's portion goes down from the 55% down to 46.2%. So if you take the 40 million, uh, but, 350. Okay, yes, but that. It's still preliminary, but. Uh, there's lie and liar's figure. I mean, I could argue. And I hope I, you're not. No, I'm not suggesting it. that, but we can interpret it, the numbers. Obviously that takes into account that we already got a contingency that could be reallocated to the county. So we haven't reduced the county's share necessarily there. Administrative costs are gonna be shared by the county. so appropriate to allocate those figures but if we are going to take those out and make a net number if we are because I, I, it can be argued both ways if we're going to take it out i'm just saying to quantify what mr sanchez's guidance was it goes from 55 percent to 46 percent. i also you know mr sanchez's comments well taken the county has way more than if you total up all the requests the county has way more than the funds that we're going to allocate under any scenario in terms of potential requests. We don't have the benefit of what the municipalities are gonna ask for because they, but we do have preliminary numbers for them. And under the same criteria, they're gonna have more too. The question is, we talked about a 55-45 split. What the chairman suggesting is appropriate to do, but I think we need to go through these specifics so that we can then have a framework to understand to move forward with. So let's get back to the local government allocation of $1 million. And the question is, what pool does this committee recommend that that come from? Unincorporated. Is everyone un are comfortable with that coming from the unincorporated chair? I have a question if... Mr. Sheffield. Can, so I think the local government should come from the 45% that's allocated to local government. Is that being debated? Well, that was one proposal. We've got three concepts here. One is that it uh, be shared. One is that it comes from the 45% or one that it comes from a subset of the 45% and that being the allocation to the unincorporated areas. Okay. I, 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 I feel strongly that local government should come from the 45% local government, whether how you allocate between the uh, unincorporated, you know, that, that wouldn't matter to me, but so thanks. 
All right. Is it, so we've got uh, Ms. Thomas is suggesting that the million dollars come from the unincorporated area allocation. Um, Mr. Fraz seems to indicate he could support that. Does anyone else object to that as a committee? I mean, I'm on board with either a split or out of the municipal piece. A lot of the services offered, whether it be a park district to preserve um, or some of the township services, frankly, are, are enjoyed by municipal residents too. Right. Mr. Sanchez? I would prefer to just take it from the, the general 45% um, allotment just to keep things simple. All right. Mr. Sergis? Take it from the 45, take it from them. All right, all right. Take it from the 45. All right, so we're gonna, the, the million dollars from the, the consensus of the committee is the other local governmental bodies comes from the 45%. A portion of that will be funded by the uh, unincorporated areas, but not 100%. All right, that, and then we have not-for-profits. There's 2 million proposed to be allocated in not-for-profit groups. What's the will of the committee with respect to that share? Mr. Fraz? I would think that the not-for-profits overwhelmingly, they serve us all, but they overwhelmingly serve the, the urban areas. I would say take it from the municipal. Mr. Sanchez, that was your recommendation from the start, correct? Mm -hmm. Same. Uh, Kenyon says yes. Mr. Sergis? Yes. Ms. Thomas? Yes, I'm okay with that. Okay, Mr. Hansen. I dissent. I, I think the people that are are faced with housing challenges or hunger challenges or looking for um, social services don't know boundaries. And I think whether it be uh, a, a PADS-based organization, a Lazarus House or a Hesed House, as an example, um, they don't exclude people based on where they live in the county. But if, if it comes from the municipal share, the unincorporated areas are sharing as well because they that's 11% of the municipal share anyway. So, all right, so the consensus is that um, comes from the uh, 45%. The final item is the $8 million set aside for business grants. I think this one's the, a little bit more challenging. It's a more significant number, um, but what is the will of the committee with respect to the $8 million? It, Mr. Fries? It's such a big item, either one is gonna it's really going to impact either side of the equation. And, um, I, you know, I keep going back to the, the, uh, the gambling money, uh, when we research that, the, the, uh, slot machines and the overwhelming number of businesses were in municipal city limits. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess my feeling is this is a good opportunity for a split. So you're suggesting split split the small business equally between the county and the municipal. Mr. Hansen. You know where I stand by now. I believe it should all come from the county piece. So we have one split, one all from the county. And uh, Mr. Sanchez said all from the municipality. Mr. Kenyon. I take it all from municipalities. Mr. Sergis. Sanchez. I'd split. 55, Ms. Thomas. Split. All right, so we have uh, three splits, one all from the county and two from municipal side. Um, I'm good with a split, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, we're all gonna benefit the whole, the whole, all the people on the county. My consensus or my recommendation would also be to uh, to split that, I think the is you know the businesses all benefit both the county and the the strength of the businesses. It's both county and municipal benefits. So, um, Mr. Sanchez, can you live with a split? If I have to. All right, that's it. I'll take that as a yes. Um, no question. Yes. Yeah. So effectively, the the 8 million business would come off the top. Correct. That's the effect okay. of the discussion. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yes. Sure, Ken. Mayor Burns. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Kevin Burns, City of Geneva and President of Metro West. A quick clarifying question on the $8 million business grant coming off the top. That's coming off the top of the 45%? No, it would be, the proposal would be, it'd be it, it would, um, just to walk through the math, it would be shared from the 45 and 55%. So it would be shared. And would that, um, depending on the language constructed by the state's attorney, would that require municipalities, should they so grant a business that businesses only within those municipalities can benefit from such a grant? The, uh, I think the, the reason that we had talked about having the grant program for businesses be administered through the county as opposed through the municipalities is because the just like the fire districts is because sub recipients in federal grant parlance makes it different or more difficult. So to the extent that the municipalities intended to include in their request business grant funding, that they would be relieved of that because we would be providing funds to do that in our, from our, uh, or from this allocation. Would you allow municipalities who file their application for CARES Act funding to also include documents relating to their efforts to provide relief to businesses through their own offices? In other words, uh, forbearance of utility fees, forbearance of liquor license fees, forbearance of utility tax fees, forbearance of penalties, et cetera? So that wouldn't be a grant directly to the business. It True. would be reimbursement to the city. For no, it's, it's no reimbursement. It's a grant, an actual a, waiver, yeah. It's a, it's a uh, so forbearance of all those fees, for instance. But so the applicant would be the municipality, not the, not the 100 businesses that, or 20 businesses that were given the deferred. But my question is this then, if, if a business applies for a grant from the county, would the county's process then ask that business, have you received any other grants from any other entity? Well, what, that's, that's the discussion for our meeting on business grants and what the program will be like, but those are, can be criteria that we establish as a condition of doing that. Okay, we'd be help, happy to help you do that. You sure, no, they, and um, there was an example, I think uh, Mr. Berger had put together uh, that gave, it, it, it's in somewhere in the packet of materials, that talked about variables that other entities in, sure. in Illinois and out of the state have used in tailoring their business grant programs. Uh, they talked about number of employees. They talked about right. uh, gross revenue. They talked about other grant opportunities, that kind of thing. So um, yes, th th that those are all be factors that would be open for discussion and should be incorporated into the ultimate right. project or program guidelines. Thank you. All right. All right, so to, to summarize what the committee has recommended, and this would go in a motion that we could then pass on to exec and or the full uh, board would be to allocate the uh, funds. And if you, we can use the example that's on the board, but we can edit that as we go through it. We have 92,900,000 plus another $87,000 that uh, the treasurer's identified uh, in funds. We would establish a $5,000 contingency fund. I'm uh, 5 million, I'm sorry. And uh, set aside $600,000 for administrative costs and also set aside $8 million uh, to establish a business grant program. That would leave 79300 thousand two hundred eighteen dollars that would be allocated 55 45 among the various uh, entities and we could if you bear with me I'll do the math as we speak because then there won't be any confusion All right, $79,300,218 times 55%. That's $43,615,119 would be allocated under the county's 55% share. $43,615,119. And then by simple math, which I can't do in my head anymore. 
that would leave 35 million 685 to the uh, municipal share. And then from that, the from the municipal share, we would allocate one million three fifty to forest preserves and other local units of government. One million, I'm sorry, the fire protection districts. I keep misstating that. One million to other units of local government, and then two million uh, to not for profits which would effectively make the, um, that's 4.35 million, right? 4,350,000. That would make the allocable share to the, un or to the municipal entities 31,335,098. So the, um, to your point, Mr. Sanchez, the total population number that we were using was what number? 500 532. 532,000? 403. Okay, at, five, at 532, that's $58 for 90 cents, so roughly in the, in the mid fifties, which I think was your anticipated goal of being in that range. I've got a chart that's at about 55, 98, and it shows, I think 29.8 million as a total. So right. yeah, real close. All right, so, um, and that was, that was supported by, or we got back to that number by allocating some of the business grants to the county side. That's the effect of that. All right, so with that background, then the motion would be to send on a resolution to the committee to uh, establish a $5 million contingency fund, $600,000 administration fund, $8 million business grant fund, all that would come off the top and then allocate the balance among the county and municipal entities 55-45 with then from the 45% share of the municipal allocation, 1,350 from the forest preserve or for fire protection districts, 1 million for other governmental entities and 2 million for not-for-profit organizations. Mr. Sergis, do you move that? Is there a second, Mr. Hansen? Any further discussion? And we can incorporate this into a revised spreadsheet that we can put together. Um, yes, Mr. Hansen. Within the resolution, can we have it allocated so whatever interest we do accrue for the money we hold is, is directed into our contingency fund? So it has a destination. I don't have any objection to that. Is that fine for the committee? So that would bolster the uh, contingency fund? Ms. Thomas? No, I was just saying I, I support that. Okay. All right, so we'll add that to the motion, Mr. Do we have a deadline for the contingency <clears throat> fund? I think that's something we've got to work through as we go through the application processes. So I think this is just the first, this is getting that pot divvied up. Uh, we can begin working on the business grant program, the not-for-profit criteria, the contingency fund discussion. I think the contingency fund uh, discussion would logically occur after we get applications and if we're over -app applied in any given area, we may choose to allocate some right off the top. This is, a, again, as I mentioned last week when we brought up this topic, this isn't a multi-year deal that we're dealing with. We have to get these funds allocated this year. But let's say we have a two or a three week grant application process we can find out on the, uh, on the um, fire protection district side, for example, if we allocated 1.3 million and then there's 1.5, we could 
easily allocate 150 to that program and just fund it. So I think that's a work as you go program. I think ultimately, um, as we go through the county allocations, we'll see that we're gonna have more requests than what we have. We'll also see that maybe on the municipal side and then we can decide how to do with it. It's just, it, I know for me, it's just taken a little bit to recalibrate myself from being everything's coming here and we're subcategorizing right. it to no, 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 you know, right. it needs to be a direct coming from, so it's right. just taking a little bit to. I think in the end, the, the fact that we have the staff to control the input and output on these sub, what were otherwise gonna be sub recipients will help us get to the bottom line more quickly, hopefully. All right, Mr. Sanchez. I have a question for State's Attorney McMahon, and it just, it refers to the original resolution that we passed that set up the 55-45 split with the idea that we'd send out 80% right away. Does that have to be amended? Is what we're talking about now, assuming it gets passed by the board, is it gonna contradict in any way with that original resolution? And it might be way in the weeds to answer right now, but. No, you're fine. Okay. All right, so that, but that does raise a good point. That being that um, of the, 31,333 that is allocated to the municipalities. If applications come in and the we're authorizing 80% of that money to go out right away. The other 20% would be subject to vetting as we go forward. Okay, so the original allocation 5545 serves as the basis of our discussion here. This, I guess maybe we put language to the extent that this is you know, this would control if it's inconsistent with the prior resolution. It would. Yes. Right. And I, and I understand that there was a discussion a couple of weeks ago about making up to 80% of the allocation available right away. And right. I understand that's still the will of this committee and, and the board. Right. All right. Any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Or I'm sorry. Could you roll please call. call the roll? Sorry. Hanson? Aye. Kenyon? Yes. Franz? Yes. Manchez? Yes. Surges? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Boucher? Yes. Motion carries. All right, so with the assistance of the uh, clerk and the chairman's office and the state's attorney's office, we'll have that resolution available for consideration so it can go to the full board at our next meeting. Yes, it's it's it is dependent. Sorry, it is dependent on the state's attorney's office because uh, I'm assuming that they're taking the notes and going through right. in all of this. But subject discussion. to this math being documented properly, we've got a placeholder on the agendas yes, to move. Forward. We certainly do. Great. Okay. Uh, also, um, one of the things that we um, also ought to touch base on is the final application and IGA. I have a note from Aaron Brady from the state's attorney's office from a request we made on Friday uh, that the document, the red line document from uh, July 24th is the one that we're using. I think some of the blanks can be filled in at this point on that. Uh, and so we should have, you know, following uh, Mr. Fraz's uh, advice to all of us a couple weeks ago, that should be, um, you know, as finalized as possible before we vote on it. And then on the selection of the uh, consultant, uh, the, uh, when those uh, applications, RFQs came in, uh, the selection committee that was used, uh, I'm assuming that it wasn't uh, just a, a single, uh, a, you know, the state's attorney by himself, and then what the written scoring tally was as we do all of these RFQs. This scenario is a little bit different because uh, when you authorize me to retain a consultant, uh, it's, I have internal control that this board doesn't. So uh, under the internal control set, statute, uh, I retained KEB. And so I did solicit additional input. Um, I relied heavily on recommendations of staff and the evaluation of a handful of individuals. But under the internal control statute, I can retain okay. a consultant and I did that. Okay, so I understand that the conclusion is that Mr. McMahon has selected uh, KEB. Then what I would suggest is so that we're following the procurement laws that I, we're all sworn to follow uh, the laws that you'll have timestamps on when uh, each of your two candidates that you have sole 
decision to make that decision when you received those applications. Because what was said at the meeting last week uh, was that um, uh, both of those applications came in uh, after the, um, the time, which was Friday at noon, uh, the 24th at noon. And what was reported to this group last week uh, said that uh, we received two last week. I have that quote someplace here. Mr. Chairman, I, I think we've already discussed this on the agenda and I, the, yes. the state's attorneys agreed to follow provide us follow information. I look forward to receiving that. Once we get it, if there's more questions, we can address Fine. those. Okay, as long as we know the time and then the packages for the two applicants. Okay. All right. Um, yes. Um, and Joe, just, I mean, I'm, I might, and again, I, I, I apologize for always trying to slow things down, but my understanding, the methodology that we're using the pullback of the in the IGA that said if money was spent the wrong way, I really like that. But you're saying it's no longer required because of the way we're doing it with the subcat with the sub. Help me. I think there are two complete better. I'll, I'll tell you, my understanding is there were two components to it. Number one, the approach we're taking is asking for requests for reimbursement as opposed to advanced funding. Exactly right. And that tends to minimize with the vetting of our auditors, the risk we're taking. But the other issue was a legal concern about uh, the concept of being able to what would effectively be garnishing future levies as it relates to a, a condition of this grant program. And that that was a concern that was raised. And so what we did is we changed the program to try to minimize those concerns. All good. All good. Because I'd love to just keep it in there. And even if it doesn't have the teeth that we thought it did, we'll worry about that later. But I'd be more comfortable having it in. But what you're telling me is that's not even the conversation. It's not even needed because of the methodology. It's not needed because of the methodology. Uh, I, I'm glad to re-examine whether we want to just put it in there. But I think it's, a, it, I think it's extra language that uh, is not really applicable to the program that we're talking about when we're reimbursing expenses. Uh, but I'll, I'll, we'll revisit the decision to pull that language out. All right. I get it. And I, I hear you. Just slow to the draw on this one. I get so. it. All right. Thank Except you. you want to get the money out tomorrow. <laughs> that, I mean, we I, had this conversation. Is that your twin before. brother that was at all the other meetings? <laughs> you can put this right in and keep moving. That's okay with me. That's what I'm saying. There's no reason to slow it down and take it out. All right, um, census figures, are we uh, good on census, Mr. McMahon? So I'm good on census figures. Uh, my recommendation and the census figures that I want you to use are the same figures that the federal government used and that's the 2019 uh, census data. All right, and that was the committee's general consensus last week was to do that. Does anyone have any objection to doing that? We talked about an appeal process. Process, if there's an objection, we can deal with that going forward. I think that's a great way to go. It's gonna take care of almost everything. And if somebody has a problem, they can appeal it. All right. Chairman. And again, those are, we have contingency funds as well. Another reason for that. Right. All right. Mr. John. Many of the municipalities that might not agree with this have the ability to stop us in our tracks. <clears throat> I'm sure there's legal terms for that. They could, I mean. Can they file an injunction and say, hey, we never agreed to those numbers? Uh, there's a, I suppose there is that possibility, yes. But part yes. of the application submits an, an, a number where they assert their, right. their. Uh, yeah, you either agree or you number. don't sign here. Right. Can I ask a question? Um, yes, Mr. Shefflow, you have the floor. So, okay, so. Um, I think that uh, Mr. McMahon sent a link to census data. Uh, when I clicked on that, I basically got nowhere, but I, I would like to see or ask Mr. McMahon, his consultant, his employee to put together this information 
um, where it's been determined because I've always heard that the, the US Census Bureau does not break down mu municipalities by county and they break down but they uh, you break raised down. this last <laughs> week with yeah. Mr. Scheffel. So let's, Mr. McMahon, can you distribute the um, census figures again? I will redistribute the census figures. Uh, I had some assistant, and when you click on that link, uh, there are a couple other steps that you can uh, look at uh, layout by county, by uh, municipality. And so there are a number of steps that you have to go through other than just clicking on that first link. Uh, but we were able to pull out population from U.S. Census data set or data, uh, municipality population. population, and then for those municipalities that cover multiple counties, that portion of the population that resides just in Kane County. All right. Um, so we'll follow so, up on that item. So we could we could get that distributed so everybody can look at it. I mean. Um, well, there's that, nothing to distribute, really. There was staff time spent working through these spreadsheets and pulling out numbers from the data from the U.S. Census Bureau. But, and, well, all I've seen is the, the total, uh, you know, listing our cities and then listing their Kane County po populations. But um, is there a way of having like those to sit with staff and look over their shoulder and watch them click through the different spreadsheets and links uh, and I'll try to get that arranged for you Mr. Shefflow or directions on how to get that done maybe um, I don't know if I mean I could do that over the telephone I guess with somebody um, does does a total 532,000 I mean, Aurora has gone up 40,000 and I, I'm not arguing that the Aurora number was wrong, but somehow we've changed a lot of these numbers and I mean, we've added 40,000 people. So we've taken that 40,000 out of the remaining municipalities. No, the I mean, it's five, still, five, still has a total of 532, 407 or whatever the it totals 532,403, and that includes the Aurora City population in Kane of 13608. Um, okay. Is there a, you'd want a, a particular staff member that could walk me through that? That'd be great. Um, or I could call your office or you could email probably them. Hard, probably hard to do in a Zoom meeting, Doug. You'd probably, but we could set well, up a time to get you together. Either way. All right. Um, I'm having eye surgery tomorrow or Wednesday. So, um, but actually doing it from home would be, I, well, anyway, I think they could walk me through. Uh, I'm not totally incompetent. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, then moving on on the agenda, the, um, had discussion about the county use of the share that was going to be allocated uh, to the county. Um, we have a number of, uh, well, last meeting we went through a series of requests for um, non payroll funding. Uh, we have Mr. Ronzik uh, provided us an updated uh, spreadsheet which shows the projects that were tentatively approved and then those that were removed, which reduced the, uh, there was roughly 28 million on that sheet, which has been reduced to 20.6 million. Uh, then there were different other additional documents provided that, um, and, and we've got uh, sheets which I've numbered for purposes of discussion. We have Mr. Onzik's original master spreadsheet, um, and then we have the, items that we didn't discuss last week that we deferred primarily the sheriff's requests and the coroner's request and those that we asked for additional information. Then there was a sheet of non-payroll past expenditures that were potentially eligible. Those were 1.08 million. 
And then we had the breakdown that Mr. Onzik provided pursuant to our request for COVID specific overtime and on-call pay. Uh, that share, which is not part of the health department allocation uh, is 473,000. With the health department allocation, it's a total of 1.796 million. So uh, has everyone had a chance to review those in detail to the extent? I didn't see the corner stuff. All right, well, we, the Sorry. corners, we didn't get any specific detail on that other than that's back for discussion today. So we can, and there was some support that was provided for that. I believe the bulk of that was a couple additional vehicles. So why don't we do this? I just, I wanted to start this discussion by saying that I, I want to get a total population of potential requests so we get a handle on what the numbers are. And Mr. Onzik, maybe you could help me through this. But with last week's items, the non-payroll funding request, um, the items that we ag agreed to uh, minus the deletions, that was $20.6 million, okay? Just to give you a number, and we gotta total these up. Today for consideration, we have another $7.8 million in um, requests here for non-payroll funding requests. We've got, so that we can just do the tally. You got 20.6 plus 7.8, plus 1.08 million, which is the non-payroll past expenditure itemization we received. And then if I'm correct, I looked at the original spreadsheet that Mr. Ronzik gave us, which had all the columns broken down. And those columns included some of the numbers that I already went through. So if we extrapolate them out, there was about another $25 million in payroll expenses. Is that accurate? Yes, the additional 25 million included um, the breakdown that I provided for you that has the, um, the incremental. The payroll. incremental, right. So yes. I, that's why I didn't include that. So what we're talking about in terms of the, and, and, and does the, so we've got 25 million uh, plus 20 plus 7.8 plus one. If we do the math, that's 45. 52, 53 million plus or minus in potential county requests. Is that a, a comprehensive list or does that, does that number include the health department requests or are they on top of that? If you're taking that, well, that original report that I had that yes. I think it totaled 63 million. 63 million, right. Right, so that included, I'm sorry, the health department um, request of a I think it was the total 12.3 million or something in okay. that amount, 12 point something. But was, were the health department requests also in these breakdowns or were they? Yes. yes. Okay, so we bet we're not double counting those uh, because no. we, had the, we had in that uh, $20.6 million number, mm -hmm. that was a contact tracing. All those were in that sheet that we approved last yes. week we considered. Yes. All right, so just from a big picture perspective, what we're looking at is we have roughly $53 million in requests from the county. And per the calculation we did today, um, 43.6. What was left for the county side? 43.6? 43.615. All right. 43,615,000. And so our work as I understand it is to pair that to the extent all of these are reimbursable under the program would be to pair those numbers down by $10 million roughly, an additional 10 million. Would that in terms of big picture math make sense? Yes. All right. Now I have one question and this gets back to getting into the weeds, but is there a way to break out in this allocation the um, cost of sheriff's patrol because my thought is that sheriff's patrol, just like the mayor of Batavia is gonna submit 
his request for Batavia police with the Batavia municipal requests. The sheriff's patrol is primarily unincorporated areas and that theoretically shouldn't come out of the county share. It should come out of the unincorporated share under the municipal share because that's for the unincorporated areas. So is there a way to extract that number from this 53 million? Because it seems to me we could easily shift that over into that pool and, and cover it that way. Yes, and would, by sheriff's patrol, would you also include correctional officers or no, just- well, the, 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 the jail is countywide. Yes. You know, it serves everyone. So that seems to me to be a countywide expense. But when the sheriff targets his patrol, at least, you know, that seems to me, they don't patrol in the city of Geneva. We have mutual aid, of course, but just like Geneva will go out in the county and cover a, a call on mutual aid. But that the deputies that patrol the unincorporated area should be paid by the unincorporated pool, okay. it seems. Does that logic make sense to the committee? Mr. Sergis? Okay. So is there a way to, because as we try to figure out where the, uh, we've got 4 million plus or minus in, in money being allocated in the unincorporated areas, it seems to me that that would be the appropriate cost to allocate to that pool. I, I can pull that out. I don't have it with me at this moment, but yes, I can, I have it. And I, I, I'm just, all right. So it, would there be an easy way to look on this? I mean, we could look on the payroll for the sheriff I just don't know how much of that is corrections and how much is. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to go back. I mean, and look at the spreadsheet. Okay. But that would be the, that would be the area that you would yes. look, right? Okay, under the. Um, uh, so this is on the master sheet where we're looking at um, uh, the sheriffs, uh, um, whatever, including emergency management. They've got twenty-eight million out of the sixty-three million in costs. And I mean, there's, that's got to be a pretty significant number for the patrol function. It, it is, but in the millions the, of dollars, I would expect, right? It's, oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but there's also included in the, the correctional. Right. I just okay. am not I'm sure of the percentage split. Does that, okay. So, well, when we were trying to get this number down to match the requests, we need to have the money come from somewhere. And that, to me, would be at least appropriate to shift some of the burden to the unincorporated allocation. All right, is it a consent, consensus of the committee to at least identify that so we can consider it? Yeah. All right. All right. So the um, is let let's focus then on the non-payroll funding requests that we didn't cover last week. The seven point eight million, which started with a coroner's capital request. Is there someone here from the coroner's office to address that, Mr. Russell? I didn't see you, I apologize. I didn't, I did, yep. You're appropriately socially distanced. <laughs> yes, um, apologize for being late. I was actually in the middle of my accreditation audit, which by the way went well, very flying colors. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, yes, I believe I've sent out a separate sheet uh, for all the, those, the capital items. Um, that was on uh, that we're asking for, which is approximately five hundred thousand. I think it's four or something. Um, did everybody get that? I received it. It showed the vehicle and yes. the primary cost. If if and I'm going to try to break this down as a divider between the trans the drivers and the uh, the remains. Right. Correct. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so. so and our current vehicles don't have that. Correct. Is there a way to retrofit an existing vehicle to, to have that installed? Um, there is. Um, I don't know how effective it's going to be uh, because it's actually, we have vans, so we'd have to put plexiglass or something up, and it just, I don't think it's very effective. I don't think it would be very good. The, the nice thing about these, these are ambulances that have been, uh, Actually, the um, OEM has one very similar to that that was purchased um, earlier this year. Um, so there's something that the, the county is very familiar with as far as the actual equipment. Uh, it is designed um, so that uh, basically that, uh, you know, the air handling systems are separate. Uh, um, 
it'd be kind of like um, a building who's, that's not built to, to do that, kind of like what we have now and having the, the air handling issues. So, um, How old yeah. are the existing vehicles? Do they have significant trade-in value? Uh, some, uh, we have a 2013 um, van. We have a 2010 van, which is actually uh, from the sheriff's office that we, we got. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, we have, and then we have a, another truck um, that would have some, definitely, the truck would have some good resale value. All right, so um, does anyone on the committee have questions of the coroner? How many, Rob, I am, I am so sorry, and, and I acknowledge when I walked in, for some reason, I didn't get yours. Okay. And that's not to say I didn't accidentally hit a delete button and then couldn't find it. Okay. How many total vehicles are you, I just remember when you came weeks ago and presented, I just remember going, yuck, I wouldn't, yes, <laughs> get the guy the truck. But I don't know why I had that reaction. I just remember that was my reaction. Sure. How many trucks are you ultimately asking for? Two. Two, and that's the whole five hundred thousand, or what? no? That's a it's a large, uh, large part of it. Uh, there's also some hoods and some uh, um, I forget what they call them, the positive pressure um, masks, more or less. It's not a, a and, mask. And if, if we're to the point where we're trying to make judgment calls, mm -hmm. can you make it with one and two? Was the great wish list? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I I would be happy to support and modify to get one of these at least. I mean, his fleet. if my recollection is correct, the total cost of the vehicles was about 390,000 combined roughly. Combined. Yes, yes, combined. So you're talking about $200,000 for a vehicle roughly. With the back end, the, it's not just the vehicle, but it's also the, yeah, all the equipment and stuff. Mr. Hansen. Morning. Hey, Rob. Hi. Good afternoon, pardon me. Um, I had to go back and, and find the I think the report you're referencing came back on June the 12th. If you're fishing around for that at home, um, has has any of your requests within the big report changed since the 12th of June? It looks like it's two trucks, um, a fill air filtration system. Um, an x ray machine. Yes. And any substantial changes since then? I know there's there's small expenses around the office. Anything big? No. Okay, the question about um, air filtration, is that baked into the design for the multi-use facility? Because are we building something right now that's only gonna help us for the next, hypothetically, six, eight months? Um, question two, is the X-ray is the X-ray machine coming with us to the new building? It is. Okay, um, and same, there was one other, the, the body bag containment system, the bio seal. Bio seal. Does that come with us to the new facility? Yes. Okay. Any other questions or suggestions on this item? And specific to the coroner? Coroner, yes. No. This, this is Ms. Thomas, I have a question. Go ahead. So um, I'd, I'd like us to know for sure whether the current vehicles can be retrofitted and if so, what the cost is. I, it wouldn't be effective. Um, you're talking about regular vans that are used for cargo. Um, it's, it's my opinion that it would not be effective. So it would be, you know, so trying why, to break concrete with a claw hammer. Uh -huh. it, it's a whole different chassis. Yeah. One's like a one ton pickup chassis and the others that the existing are vans that are all, all, uh, formed in one piece from, from the dashboard to the back. Correct. Yes. Correct. All right. Um, I think a, a reduced version of the request seems appropriate given our desire to try to fit our requests within a, um, a financial restrictions we have. Um, is it the, is there uh, support for Mr. Sergis' uh, suggestion that we uh, approve one vehicle? Yes. Mr. Kenyon says yes, I'm Mr. Sanchez. I'm, I'm comfortable with a reduction of two vehicles to one. I do wanna ask about the six ozone air purification systems. I'm okay with, with one truck instead of two, but how 
many of those six do we actually need, especially if they're not going to be, uh, will, are they going to slot into our new facility or not? Yes, those are actually like room, uh, room. They're not, they're, they're, they're portable. So they could actually be taken with us out on a scene even if we needed to. Um, if we get a real bad decomp situation or bad uh, um, infectious situation, we could actually bring it to the scene, plug it in, let it run, and um, hopefully it'll mitigate some of the uh, infection, you know, from the area. But they're they're very uh, they're very portable, um, so we'll we'll take them with us to the. We're going to have more offices in the new place, um, and I think we're just from what I saw is just UV lights that are going to be used for the filtration, it's not ozone. So to have that extra is is good. I just don't know if we need, I'm just curious if do we need six, that's all. Is three better? I mean, three would be fine. I mean, to figure if we're gonna have three, might as well order six and because uh, we have a couple now, then they're starting to break. So I figured, well, it'd be good to have some of them that were in the waning in case some of the others break, but that's fine. if. If the committee's more comfortable with three, I'm, I'm fine with that. If we were to reduce um, the $500,000 request to 250, is that acceptable? Depends how much the truck is. If the truck is one, 190. 190-ish. Sure, sure. All right. well, our primary concern should be protecting his right. employees. Right. I think all I mean, of these are going to do dollars, this. But their health is yeah. the most important. You know, I was I was being somewhat conservative what I was asking for. I mean, I wasn't asking for, you know, a lot of things that I could have. And I just, but I wanted to narrow the, the request to something that I felt was COVID related. And I didn't want the, uh, the county to ever have to be on the hook for something that was over embellished. So that's why the, the product that you see in front of you, in my opinion, is all COVID related. And I don't think it would have any problem. Right. Um, but that's my opinion. All right. You guys are the ones that are here to decide. All right. That. Any other questions of Mr. Russell? Okay. Hearing none, let's move on to. I thank you. Mr. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Sanchez. I just had a comment that um, minus the one vehicle, his request would go down to $262,000. So right. we're talking 250 and then we shave some. 262? Is 62. that the correct? Sorry, my math was wrong. All right. So 262 is a consensus okay with that? All right, we'll move forward. Thank you, Mr. Russell. All right, IT, Roger, item 34 was the next item on the list. This was the uh, camera systems. Uh, is this something that you wanna follow up on or? Um, at this time, I believe the sheriff is trying okay. to address it through uh, capital budget uh, with the county. But at the time when we discussed it and put it into the request list, it was about the judicial center and the uh, adult, corrections. adult corrections and the uh, camera system allows you to um, use artificial intelligence to determine whether or not people are following policies related to face masks, related to location in the building. You can tell how many people are congregating in one of the court buildings or one of the hallways or a location. It'll also tell you if uh, you use thermal cameras, it'll tell you if you have people running around with temperatures. So there's a uh, COVID uh, correlation to that, that is, uh, uh, gives their officers the ability to see things in building control um, without having to physically go uh, inspect every area of the buildings. All right, is there any, is there anyone from the sheriff's office here today? All right, the, um, any further questions on item 34? What's the I, will of this is Ms. Thomas. I have a question, and maybe this is better safe for when the sheriff is there. But you know, you have store clerks who don't want to enforce the mask policy. So, with something like this, are we talking about, you know, if someone's identified with a temperature on camera, the deputy's going to go find them in the building? I mean, or we only use the information if it turns out they're positive. I mean, it just I'm just wondering how this will be used practically when we find information that about about people we're tracking. 
All right, the sheriff isn't here to address that. Is it something for the sheriff to address? I think that's probably best. I would say that by a matter of like standard operating procedures, the SOP with the sheriff's court security, they're checking everybody's temperature um, at the entrance. And some people use obviously other entrances or employee entrances where they may not get checked. Um, but the, the main, in, main entrance, they already are checking temperature when you enter. All right, um, for the sake of time, I just wanna jump ahead to items 49. I'm gonna exclude 55, uh, or I'm sorry, 49 through excluding 67. These are smaller items, many of them appear to be directly COVID related. Does anyone have any objection to those items? So we then can focus our time on the specific larger requests that are contained in here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have an objection to some of these items. All right, you then we'll go 40... through line by line. Which ones do you have well, objections no, to? Uh, so there are several for sanitizer, uh, like wipes. And so I, you know, I couldn't tell from this list if maybe some of these have actually been purchased, which I understand, but I think they need to consolidate some of these nine items such as 50, 56, 61, 69, which all mentioned sanitizer, 68 mentions wipes, you know, and it calls into question, you know, whether we should have some central purchasing. I mean, you know, the sheriff order gets his order, his needs list together, the various departments get all their lists together and get them to the health department so we can like do a central order or something. Um, right. Let's, I don't wanna spend, I don't think we have the time to go through each line item in that list. So we can ask the sheriff to consider consolidating. Let's go back and then I'll, we'll start up at the top. 41 or 44 is uh, filtration, ultraviolet lights for cleaning medical unit at the jail. Anyone object to this one? Hearing none, we'll move on to 45. Robot to monitors health and body temperature. Yeah. Want to know more about it? Okay, we're gonna ask for more information on that from the sheriff. Uh, we did have the presentation on the uh, communication systems upgrade at our um, at uh, one of the uh, meetings we had. Uh, the, I think it was the special executive committee meeting, if I recall correctly. Does anyone have any question on that or question the need for it, Mr. Sanchez? Yeah, so this is one that I think a lot of people are in favor of. We had some... Um, communications from the state's attorney's office that uh, suggested we don't approve this through the CARES Act money. And as far as I know, that still stands. My understanding is that the basis is beforehand, before COVID, we were saying over the radio waves, oh, this person has TB or HIV or whatever the disease may be, and we have to take precautions for it. And now we have COVID being broadcast. So there is really no change just because COVID, that information was being um, broadcast on the radios beforehand. Uh, speaking with Michelle Guthrie, um, I found out that all of those designations were actually lumped under one term. I believe it was universal precautions. They can correct me if I'm wrong. And so they weren't saying TB or HIV or you know, hep C over the radio waves, whereas now COVID-19 has to have its own separate designation. So I didn't know if the state's attorney, I, I meant to follow up with you on this. I'm sorry, I apologize that I didn't. So I'm throwing this out for during the meeting. You know, I don't I, know if you guys have had that conversation yeah. yet and if there's been any new um, understandings. What I, what I would suggest we consider doing here um, is if we feel that it's appropriate to include, we include it subject to being vetted through the process because I don't think we're doing that with any of the others. I mean, obviously if not, if there's a line item request in here that doesn't meet the standards, we'll get feedback and then we can evaluate it. Okay. Um, and so I think the arguments can be made that all of these are incremental. Someone could argue otherwise, but if it does, I think if the, if 
if that does create a, a distinction that allows this to pass, then I, the question is, what's the will of the committee? Is the committee willing to invest 5 million of these funds in that project, in that project? I would be in favor. Everyone else? So the consensus is okay on 46, subject of course, like every one of these getting vetted. Next one is a body temp scanner to conduct uh, temperature readings. Um, I think, do we need, if we're gonna, what's the feedback on that? All right. Right, I think we could have a presentation on all these components that deal with screening and and, and that. So, okay, 47 is more information. Uh, hazardous response vehicle um, for PPE fit testing operations and functions. Anyone? I have real concerns on that. Um, don't know much about it. Um, we sure need to know more about it. Yeah, it's a lot. It's, it's a single vehicle. All right. So I'm a no on that. I don't see anybody else driving around a vehicle for that use through this whole ordeal. I'm a no on that. All right. So is this something that we want more information on or that we would decline to move forward? I, I would say decline uh, pending a, uh, an appeal. I would say if we're getting information on some of these others, just lump that in and that'll be on more information. More I think then, I heard three no's on that, Mr. Chairman. Pardon? I think I heard three no's on that. I heard your no. Is there any other? Mr. <laughs> Hansen or Mr. No. Fry said no. Mr. Okay. Hansen said no. Any other no's? I mean, or do you want more information? Oh, more information, but leaning towards no. How about Mr. Same? A lot of money. Right. We've got three and then They're really, really important. I think we're going to uh, get more information on that than understanding that there's a bias uh, to, to decline. And then the rest of these, I, instead of going through them item by item, we need the sheriff here to give us a breakdown of these items. So, um, I think one question, Mr. Hansen. It we're looking at the entire list in aggregate now. Yes. Just a question about the, the last four items in our contractual services. Do, do they fit in with other contractual services we're asking for for the departments um, either now or going forward? There's a couple of big round numbers in there. How long are those contracts good for? Are other departments right. doing it? Again, back to centralized purchasing and planning for what may be a longer run with this. Yeah, buyers. future vehicle, this, you know, there's, yeah, well, let's get more information from the sheriff on these items as well. Okay, thanks. All right. All right. Um, the separate list that we got that uh, received that says 1.08 million. Um, this is a multi page document for prior expenses that were potentially eligible for reimbursement. Um, did anyone have questions on these? These were. Um, expenses that seem to be specific to the uses. And there was a, I think the most significant of which was for glass partitions, it looks like. Um, and virtual court setup. These again, Joe, were not included in the other requests. Correct. Um, the, the reason why you ended up with two lists are that these are the this long 14 page list was everything that had been already been um, incurred by the county. So it's not a decision as to whether or not to incur it, but it's already been incurred. But we just want to get permission it, uh, if you would like to give permission to have it reimbursed from um, the coronavirus relief fund. So no, nothing on this list should be repeated on the other list. There, the reason why you see some very small dollar amounts on the other list is because there were specific expenditures that had been incurred, actually been incurred, that were not on this original list. So rather than keep updating this original list, we let them add them into that second list so right. that we have two to work with. 
I'm gonna, the goal of this discussion was to develop a, uh, at least a request that we could submit to the county board this month and to executive to uh, allocate uh, or purpose some of the funds that we've, uh, are gonna use for county purposes. I'm gonna make a suggestion. If we break down the items that we have, and, and by the way, you know, the, the request we have, there's really, but I'll consider two component or three components. We have the wage component of $25 million that's on the, mat, the big spreadsheet. We've got roughly a million dollars in the 14 page spreadsheet for items we've already expended. And then we have combined requests of 27 million of non-payroll funding for future expenses. Now in that non-payroll funding for future expenses, we've already approved $8 million for the health department plus or minus, and that's included in that. And we, de we determined that contact tracing and the buying of the PPE equipment was appropriate. So from a practical perspective, it seems to me that what one approach that we could take is to say that we've got $42 million in county money. Is that the number? We, 43.6 plus 5 million from previous requests. All right, 43.6. With the idea that we want to get something through right now um, and, and take action here, and this will help us on the county's budget dealing with this year and next year, but obviously these funds have to be for this year. If we were to say that we would approve the money requested for wages here of 25 million, plus we would approve the million eight. And again, these are rough numbers. So that's 26.08 million. Knowing that we've already approved 8 million for the health department and hold off on the rest until we get the sheriff's input on this and we're gonna to have to pare this list down. Uh, I would just say these lists of future funding would be the list that we would cut from um, knowing that the wage part and the already expended part would take priority. So what the resolution that we would be presenting to the board would be to approve uh, and Mr. Anzik would want to just make sure I'm not double counting. Um, we would approve 25.142 million, which is that line item on the spreadsheet, minus the share that would, uh, for sheriff's patrol, that we would be allocating to the, uh, the unincorporated, plus the million eight that was in the 14 page document. Um, and that would be our request now. And then we would hold off to our next meeting after we, we would have an update in terms of available funds. And then we would finalize the list, uh, prioritizing those expenditures that we felt were most important. So, and again, and if I'm beating a dead horse, if we order say a truck for Rob, and the truck doesn't come in until January 1st. Right. Are we cool? No. We're not. The theory that, that we're talking about items paid for, well, we need clarification. I don't know the answer to that. Joe? But the, the best approach is to- we would not be good with that. To have it and have it delivered by then, but before the end of the year. That's- Then I would make- Cleanest then order that, approach. That the time is of an essence, I would make an, a, 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 modify that to include an amount not to exceed a million dollars for those items that we think we're going to approve that would need to be ordered immediately that are, that are you know what I'm saying? They're, they're just gonna take time to get the truck. Why don't we do, we could, we could do this. I think if we get a, I'm trying to get a, it's not bare bones, it's a lot of money, $26 million onto the agenda so we can allocate that now. Um, we could always add 
and get additional information between now and the board meeting. If we want to supplement it with something that's time sensitive, right. if Roger says he has to order something. But if we do that, we've got to know that um, we've got enough money left over. And so theoretically, this committee could spend the next meeting vetting those issues out. And, and so I, I think we would know, when is our county board meeting? It's a week from tomorrow. Yeah, next Tuesday. Tomorrow. So if we had a meeting on next Monday, I know your Mondays are being taken up. How about Friday? To, to vet that out, we could consider doing that. Um, but I guess what I'm looking for is to move forward everything. I, as one committee member, I'm not sure. I know, no, we don't have enough money to cover everything yet. All right, if we cut this list back, uh, this is the list from where the cuts would logically come, unless someone objects to that. Mr. Frost? Just one thought, because um, some of these things, you know, I look at the sheriff and I think there's 70 some items and I don't pretend to uh, be able to, to uh, go through those one at a time and intelligently make decisions. So, um, you know, we, we had X amount of money requested. We have X amount left. There's a percentage in there somewhere. I can't do it in my head, but could we send these back to the departments and say, look, you know, we're going to fund you at. Well, I, but we could do that. That's an approach, but in, in fairness, we already vetted the 20, the, the first list. We may in the sheriff's, uh, list be able to vet enough and, and end up with close to at least what we need. I don't know yet. I don't know the that answer. Close. Yeah. Or some of these are all or nothing though. You can't fund 80% of a vehicle necessarily or whatever. So I guess I'm looking at like we do the budget. You know? Right. So, okay. um, or we could ask the sheriff to say, if we allocated X dollars, how would you prioritize it among these I, I would just like to get their feedback on what, right. what the priority is and not sure. leave it entirely up to us. We can pick out the big, big low hanging right. fruit, but yeah. All right, so I, I guess it does, if we were to move forward, is someone willing to make a motion to say that we would uh, recommend funding the 25 million 142 less the sheriff's patrol? Chairman Hosha. Yes. I would be willing to make that motion, but I, I wanted to make to raise a, 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 an idea. Um, definitely, I think the non payrolls where we're looking to cut, but the the sheriff's payroll is a big number. And my understanding is that he has certain um, officers that are dedicated to COVID nineteen response, and that's the number we're seeing here, the COVID eligible. Uh, Mr. Onzig, is that correct? It, yes, it, they're included in there. Um, it, the way, in terms of the, the sheriff's area, the sheriff Hain went through and identified every single employee that would be dead, substantially dedicated. And so we, we pulled those employees out and we allocated or accumulated 100% of their payroll expense. He also went through and uh, the remaining employees and then indicated the percentage that they were um, dedicated to COVID. And so we used those percentages to accumulate the cost of those employees and the total together then is what you're seeing here. Thank you. And so this is uh, something that it's a, a may not a shall. And so my question would be, and I don't assume you have the answer right now, um, out of those payroll requests, is there still money in his payroll budget that was already set for the year? that could actually cover some of those costs first before we spend CARES money on it. You know, I, I, I understand. I, what I see I'm where you're headed. I agree that that may be the case, but I maybe make a suggestion. And this is really a matter of compliance. If the payroll expenses are more clearly allocable to qualifying under the COVID program, and some of the capital expenditures are more iffy, like the radios that we talked about, Mm -hmm. To the extent that we um, provided allocation for the payroll side, it could free up money in his budget to do to pay for the other questionable items with other resources. So oh. I'm, I'm not sure that's a direct approach we want to take, but that's something we could consider. Okay. Maybe strategize with the sheriff. Let me ask more. the chairman his preference on this. Do you? Okay. Doesn't matter. Or, okay. No preference. All right. So, all right, Mr. Hansen. Thank you. And thank you, Joe, for putting everything together on Friday. It looks like dinner time. 
So appreciate that. Um, it looks like the, the recommendation you you made or asked of us was to, at a minimum, fund 50% 50, 50 of that. I, in looking at, um, yes, at the payroll expense, because because it's roughly around $25 million in total, and it is eligible for reimbursement, as best as we understand that too is subject to verification by whoever we can bring in as an expert on that. But as best as we understand, it is eligible. And so to at least um, reimburse 50% of it, that would bring in about $12 million to offset um, the expense that we actually have already budgeted for. So our, our payroll expense will be about $12 million less than what we had budgeted for. So then that savings could then be set aside to help offset like the $6 million revenue reduction related to COVID that we'll be seeing this year, as well as hold on to it for next year to help offset the 5 million that we're looking at being a reduction for next year. So although it's not really revenue replacement, the end result is because of the savings that we would see in our budget, we would have dollars to help with offset the reduction in revenue. All right, so the- So moved. All right, Mr. With the caveat to an amount not to exceed the amount of one of Mr. Russell's trucks. All right. So you want to make an exception for one of his trucks? Just one of the trucks that need, yeah. All right, so your motion is to move authorization of uh, investing money from the county share to reimburse the county for wages uh, per the spreadsheet equal to the amount requested of 25,142 minus the sheriff's patrol number. Um, and in addition, the 1.08 million on the 14 page reimbursement sheet, plus allocating funds for one of the coroner's vehicles. That's your motion. Yes, sir. Is there a second? Mr. Fraz seconds, um, any discussion? I support the 50% that he recommended as a minimum. Use that as a starting point until we can to fully vet some of these other non-payroll expenses. Right. I believe it should move forward, but. I, I didn't understand that, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I recommend reimbursing the county for 50% of the payroll expenses right. presented to us right now. That's not the motion. Okay, that was part of my discussion, that's all. All right. Just comment. So the motion is move forward with direct re re uh, reimbursement. Any further discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Jensen? Aye. Kenyon? Yes. Franz? Yes. Sanchez? Yes. Surges? Yes. Thomas? Yes. O'Shea? Yes. All right, so in terms of a resolution, we'll coordinate a resolution that will deal with that. And then what we're gonna do is defer discussion regarding the balance of the county's requests until our next meeting and request that the sheriff be present to finish up his presentation. And then we can talk about status of remaining funds. Um, this, did you get the detail, Joe, in terms of the numbers as I articulate them? All right, very good. So you can help with a resolution that would advance the county's request or approval for funding. All right, with state's attorney's coordination, or whoever does the, in the clerk's office as well. And John, if we need to meet sooner than next Monday, be happy to do it on a Thursday if you needed to, to keep these things moving. All right. I'm, I'm out of town Thursday, Friday. But. Well, where are you gonna be on an island? We can go meet you there. The All right, um, as far as further business today, then I don't, uh, I think we've covered as much as we can. We have two resolutions that would move forward. I think the just to set the, the agenda for the next meeting in terms of business to get accomplished, uh, we would have an updated uh, financial breakdown to review. We would um, be able to uh, revisit the balance of the county's requests. We would discuss the business grants 
uh, and the criteria for that program. And we would discuss the not-for-profit allocation and have a discussion of whether we're gonna have that open for all not-for-profits or limited to uh, certain, not-for-profits that serve certain needs. I think those are the primary issues we need to address. By then we should have our, and our hope would be a final application that would be vetted and, and ready to uh, roll out to the municipalities so that they can complete their applications. Mr. Fraz? As part of that, I'm hoping that we can maybe have uh, staff do some, if they have, it sounds like they've already got it, but some background and research comparables and others, you know, how other counties have handled the small business percentages right. and the criteria. Yeah, there's a, there is a worksheet that is out there that, that'll get distributed right away so we can come up with um, the variables that they've considered. All right, so in terms of meeting, um, I apologize for Monday meetings. I know next week is a uh, Tuesday is our board meeting, but um, in terms of, I think if we, um, well, if Mr. Fraz is gonna be gone Thursday and Friday, uh, is it the will of the committee to meet Wednesday or while well, we have to publish our meeting and, or is Monday again okay? Can you call in on Thursday at all? Um, maybe. I mean, I just, I'm just I don't know. Trying it, to it's, find, yeah. Well, I'll make, can I can I make call it. Gail and ask if Drew can call? <laughs> no. I know what the answer will be. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's. Um, Without me, too. <laughs> I'm going to, we've got executive this week on Wednesday, right? Yes. Um, I'm going to suggest we we just stick with Mondays because there is I mean, for a number of reasons. There's work that has to get done every time we, you know, set the wheels in motion and give direction. There's work that the staff has to do. So, uh, can we uh, shoot for Monday afternoon, same time? Angie, is that okay with you? Yes, I'll probably have to call in because I have to be out of town, but I can probably call in. All right. Very good. Then we'll set next week at this time, subject to if anyone has objections, we can alter that. Um, there's no need for uh, executive session. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Fraz moves. Mr. Sanchez seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for being here and Thank you, staff, for putting the time in to get everything in order. I have something for you. Do you have a baseball bat? Or? No. Oh, yeah.